All right, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your busy day uh, to joining me here today uh, for this Fusion 360 uh, CAM basic webinar. Um, let's just jump into it. Um, just quick, though, uh, just to make sure that we, uh, we get uh, kind of like things laid out here. Uh, make sure that you put any questions or comments in the question area uh, in the uh, go to meeting question area over there to the right. Uh, I will definitely do my best to answer as many of them as I can as we're getting uh, towards the end of the hour. I'm always trying to present uh, for about 40 to 45 minutes, but sometimes I get a little long winded. Um, but definitely put them in there. And if I don't get to them, I will definitely make sure that I email you you later uh, with all that. So uh, definitely want to jump in into to this topic and get into the software because that really what what matters. What the whole idea about this webinar is. I do want to point out that two months ago, August twenty fifth, uh, I did one with the same title, so Fusion Three Sixty Cam Basic Webinar. It is up on the Fusion uh, 360 YouTube channel. So you can definitely go up there and find uh, that uh, webinar. Now, today, the 25th uh, of October, um, though that the, the topic is the same, uh, I'm going to use a different... Uh, we are going to cover some of the same things. I'm going to try to dig a little bit deeper past what we talked about in the last um, CAM Fusion 360 uh, basic webinar. Um, so, but definitely be, be aware of that, that I'm recording this one, and so that will also be up there. So between the two, I'm hoping you know that you really get more and more value out of, of these type of webinars. And again, definitely make sure you put your comments and questions in the, the comment area so we can address some of them uh, as we are as we're going through here. Now quickly. Maybe let me just introduce myself. Uh, my name is Lars Christensen. Uh, probably the only two interesting things about me is I am originally from Denmark, uh, but moved to the United States uh, back in 99, so I've been over here for quite a while. I am a mold maker of trade um, and have worked in various uh, uh, mold shops, tool and die shops, and also high production uh, shops. Maybe the most valuable thing I can do for you today is I can share my, my email with you. So my email is lars.christensen at autodesk.com. Um, I try to answer as many emails, uh, questions as I can at the end of the day. Um, um, so definitely, you know, that is a contact for you there. Um, also, if you uh, are out on social, be aware of that I have my own YouTube channel where I talk a lot about uh, Fusion 360 and CAM. I also have a Facebook page uh, where I actually uh, do uh, some tips and tricks uh, and actually answer some of the questions uh, that gets put in the comment area of my video. So definitely uh, check uh, the Facebook page out. And then, of course, LinkedIn and Twitter and, and all that stuff. But let's jump into the software uh, because that really... It's what matters, and I will end on this slide again in the end, so you can get my email address again if you didn't get it, get it wiped down. And again, don't forget to put things in the, the question area as you are going as we are going along here. All right, so the idea behind this webinar, Fusion 360 Cam Basic, is if I do a decent job, then uh, you will feel comfortable getting in and uh, and start using some of uh, the different functions that exist inside of uh, specifically the, the CAM tools within uh, Fusion 360. So what we're going to look at here today is we're going to machine this little part that you see that is sitting uh, in the vise here. Um, and the hope is today we can actually get in and, and machine both sides. I don't think we, we managed to do that on, on, the, on the last webinar. Um, but definitely, like I said before, go and find the other webinar that was back in August 25th, and uh, you know you have more resources, right? And a lot of it is some of the same kind of material, but you know I think it was Six Sigler who said that uh, repetition is the key of learning. So uh, 
that is definitely what I'm going to kind of like follow here. So let me just go up here and hide the data panel for a second so we get a little bit more uh, real estate and let's talk a little bit about what we are in for here. So what I have here is I have a vice that is sitting on a table uh, with the part in it. And by the way, if you uh, send me an email, uh, I'll definitely be more than happy to share uh, this data sets like my other data sets with you. Uh, so you can have these vices or tables or, or, or whatever, even the models to kind of like uh, playing around with. Now, uh, there is some, you don't have to put your parts in a vice like I have done here. Uh, it's not necessary to be able to machine it inside of, a, of Fusion 360, uh, but there's some benefits about doing it, and that's one of the things that I kind of like want to cover here. So if I switch over to um, the model page and I go down to CAM, um, the first thing you have to do in here is you have to create a setup. And I think this is also where uh, many people struggle a little bit when they are new to Fusion is to kind of like get a handle on this whole setup here. Now don't forget, this is being recorded so you can always watch it again out on YouTube and you can kind of like rewind this if you don't quite get it and that's fine it's just a little bit of confusion uh, uh, that is not not a big hindering for you to do this now what I'm going to show you here is I'm going to go through the setup for this part here I've actually already created it um, but I'm going to delete it and redo it again but I just wanted to create it first so we can talk a little bit about it so I'm going to right click to go in and edit that setup and I normally recommend that when you're working in these menus inside of Fusion 360, do yourself a favor, start from the top and just work your way down. It's a lot easier. Uh, but what we are doing in the setup, the whole purpose of the setup, is that we are telling the software how things are sitting out at our machine. That's step number one. Step number two is we're telling it where we want to pick up the part so when we are standing out of the machine we're going to pick up this piece of stock at a corner or somewhere where is that going to be so the zero zero um, coordinates can come from that corner so if you're looking at my screen right now you will see that we have the orange part and then we also have like this shadow of the stock around the part and then we have this work coordinate system sitting over here, this triad or 3D gnomon or whatever you want to call it. Now, if I just zoom out a little bit, because this is probably, I think, is important. When I'm talking about what we want to uh, tell in, in the setup, when we want to tell how things are sitting out of the machine, imagine when you're looking at the part right now this is us standing we just opened the doors to the machine and we're looking in at the machine right now right this was kind of like be if we were standing on like a, a Haas or bridge or some kind of machine most vertical machines you're looking right now this is when you open the doors this is how you're looking at it and what we're really trying to do is we're trying to set the work uh, coordinate system to say where are these axes on the machine and this is how it's going to be for most of you guys. Now, every machine is a little different. I'm putting in that little uh, warning there. But for most people, what you want to end up with is you want to end up with your Z-axis, the blue here pointing up. You want the green Y-axis pointing towards the back of the machine. And then you want the X-axis to point towards your right hand. If you can just remember that, for most of you guys, C axis points up, that is blue, green is Y, pointing toward the back of the machine, and the red X axis is going to point towards your right hand. Remember that, and most of you guys are, are in good shape. Now, we are controlling that over here for the work coordinate system over here, okay? And you will see that there's some different options, and I'm going to cover these in a second. But that's what we're controlling in the first box over here is where are those X's going to be? And then we're also going to specify um, where we're going to pick up the part. 
Now that can kind of change. So you will see my gnomon is right now sitting in what we call the upper left corner. That's where I normally pick up my parts. Um, and I do that because my stock is up against the solid jaw. So that's I can count on that. There's actually a little bit of movement in your movable jaw. So I'm going to the to the upper end. And then uh, the, really the reason to do the left instead of the right is that most tool changes are sitting on the left. So that's why it's in the in the left side there. Down here we can specify uh, our model, and that is really only needed when we have, like I have here, the part sitting in a vise. Uh, where we're actually going to tell the machine, out of all these components we have on the screen, what are we actually going to put our tool path on? Then we also down here have a fixture option, and this is really valuable, uh, and and one of the reasons that I like to put my part in a vice because we can actually do some collision detection. Now I want to sp specify I don't always put my parts in a vice. If it's just a quick little job. Uh, you know, then you're fine not putting in a vise. Actually, when we're flipping this part over to the backside, we're not going to put it in a vise. But I want to show you that you can actually specify in the setup fixturing uh, for that. Our next tab over here is our stock. Uh, so um, for the stock size of your part, you have some different options in here. If you hit the drop down, I have selected relative size box. What is the default? I am adding 40 thousandths to the side of my part, and I'm adding 40 thousandths to the top, and then I have added 335 thousandths of an inch to the bottom. The reason I came up with this calculation is because my part is 0.625, and if I add 40 thousandths to the top and 335 to the bottom, that will give me one inch. So that's, I actually calculated out what that 335 to get one inch. So what I'm talking about here is you will see if I zoom in that I kind of had that shadow sitting uh, down in my vise. Now you could of course also have modeled up like your parallels in there uh, if you have done that. There is also in here another one that is called fixed size box. And that is actually also just as valid to use. This is more like if you have the piece of stock, you can measure it with verniers, and, uh, and then you could put those values in here too. And then the last one I normally use out of all these options is from solid. And I'm going to show you that in the end uh, of the presentation here. The third and last tab over here called post process. Uh, what is valuable to know about that is you can put in a program number, what can be nice. Uh, some machines need a program number. Uh, and you can also control what work offset you want to use. So 0 and 1 are doing the same thing inside of Fusion. That's G54. Uh, if you go to number 2, that will be G55. So just so you know, that's 0, what is defaults to, and 1 is G54. So that doesn't matter which one you're using there. Let me just delete this uh, setup, and we can we can go in and reset it. Let me delete. We can start over. It's almost like a cooking show here. Pull uh, the next uh, you know meatloaf out of the oven. So I'm gonna the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go up and say select my setup, and uh, we get this dialog box where we're now gonna set all the things I just went through, um, and you will see that by default here the software comes up with 21 bodies because that's what is inside of this assembly I have. Now again, if you don't have devices in the table, you don't have to worry about this. But I do, so <laughs> I have to. So I'm going to hit the, rec, uh, the X here to get out of these 21 bodies. I'm not going to machine 21 bodies. And then I'm literally just going to go over and select the part that we're going to machine. Now when I do that, then you will see that automatically the software is smart enough like narrow it down to the part that we're going to machine. And it will display that axis uh, gnomon, a triad here. But, you know, in my life, I never have much luck. Uh, you will see that it's not pointing in the right direction. We talked about that before. We want the z-axis to point up. We want the y-axis to point towards the back of the machine. And the red x-axis to point towards my right hand. 
And if I kind of like move over, we can all agree on that I'm far from that right here. That's fine. We are going to adjust that in the setup. Now, when we go over here, so if we start from the top down, the first thing we can select is we're doing milling, turning water plasma. We're doing milling, so we're fine there. The next thing is where we're going to control about moving this triad around. Now, out of all these options that is in here, these drop-down options in here, I will tell you that 99.9% .9 of the time, I only use the first one. Select Z-axis, plane, and X-axis. So if you're sitting with a notepad, write that down. Just select the first one. That's all you really need. So I'm going to select that. Now when I do that, I get two selection boxes. I get one for my z-axis. I get one for my x-axis. And then I actually get two check boxes to flip the axis if I need to. Okay? We're going to start with the z-axis. Now here's the rule. If you're selecting on a face, then the, whatever axis you're selecting it will go perpendicular to that face. If you're selecting an edge, then the axis will go along that edge. So right now, I am in the z-axis. If I go over and I select one of these flat areas, it could either be the bottom of the pocket, it could be the top of the part, it could even be this face here on my vise. The z-axis will jump perpendicular to that face. So if I go over to the pocket, I'm going to click on this. Three, two, one. You see that? See how the z-axis automatically goes perpendicular to that face. Okay? So this is the way I want the z-axis to move. Now if I want it, so that is great now. The z-axis is exactly where I want it. But I need to rotate the x and y. Now, so if we go down here, you will see we got the x-axis over here, and the same rule applies to that. If I select on a face anywhere on the model, this x-axis will go perpendicular to that. So if I go down and select on one of these faces here, you will see that my x-axis is going to go perpendicular to that face. Three, two, one. Okay? So you see that that by selecting faces, whatever axis you're selecting, it will go perpendicular. So just select the first drop-down, and then use the faces to select the different axis. The next thing we're going to do is select where are we going to pick up the part. You will see that we, again, have different options in here. Uh, in the drop-down in here, I'm going to leave it at stock point, and I'm going to go over and select that upper left corner over there. And there is um, my, my pickup point. That's where I'm going to select it. Now, I wanted to add the fixture component. So where do I want a collision detection against? So I'm going to check that box. And now I can select my solid, uh, my jaws on my bias because I want to crash protect against those. Next in my stock. Now, you saw before. I talked about that I added 40,000 sides to each one of here, and I had calculated that I was going to add 335,000 to the bottom. Now I'm back to where I was before. I'm going to hit OK. That's my setup. So I just went through the setup. Now we're going to try to went through one more setup here uh, when we do the back side of this part, so we'll get through it again. And don't forget, this will be out on. Uh, YouTube, so you can review it again. But that's the steps. I know I went through it a little fast, but there's rules in there. You follow those, you should be in good shape. All right. Up here on the menu bar, we have just went through our setup. We have our different toolpath operations. So we have the 2D toolpath. We have the 3D toolpath over here. We have our drilling. We have turning. Water jet. And then the two, probably most important, the simulation and posting out our code. So we're going to go through those um, through the remaining of this presentation. So the first tool path that I'm going to select here is a facing operation. So I'm going to go ahead and select facing. 
And notice how when I'm hovering over these uh, drop downs here, how you get that little uh, window that shows us what each toolpath kind of does with a little explanation. Use that as your kind of like, uh, you know, um, guidance. Like one of the ones, uh, especially when you get into to the three axes, and I'm actually going to do a video soon on my YouTube channel about that, but read through those uh, different options to find out what the different toolpaths do. I'm going to select the facing operation and we get presented with the menu over here to the right. Now the five tabs are always in the same order and have the same function. So the first tab is always where you select your tool. Just like when you're out on the shop floor, you got a machine apart, the first thing you will do is always select your tool, right? You got to find out what tools you have. So I'm going to go in here and I click select and it is going to open up my tool library. Now over here in the tool library, there's a couple of things I want to point out. First of all, I like to normally hit this little button up here so I kind of like get my tool libraries to show up. And these tool libraries in here, you can actually create your own as I have done here. Uh, it comes with a bunch of sample tools that you can use in here. And then what we have here, the document, that is actually where we're machining right now. If you want to get deeper into tool libraries, if you search uh, my name, Lars Christensen, uh, and on YouTube, you will find uh, my YouTube channel, and I have done kind of like a deep dive into the tool library. So definitely be, be aware of that, that you have, you know, these, all these different options in here to select tools. I'm going to go ahead and select a face mill here. So I'm going to click on, on that to face off with. And for this instance here, I'm going to just go down and hit OK. We will see we get a representation of our face mill right here. And then the drop down underneath that, you can select what you want to do about coolant. And you can, of course, put in your feeds and speeds. They can also be stored in the tool library. Uh, but be aware of that you uh, that you have those feet to speeds here. So the first tab is always your tool. The second tab is where you always select your geometry. So what are you going to machine? Now when you look here, you will see that I kind of like got a light orange boundary box around my part. So this is one of the great things about uh, being inside of a uh, solid model like, like Fusion is that the software actually knows that there's something there. So the software is smart enough here to say, all right, one, you selected a facing operation. Two, I'm assuming that you just want to face off the entire part. And that's exactly, uh, that's exactly what I want. Now, I could go in here and start selecting geometry. Um, but I, this is what I need for a facing operation. And there is still three more tasks, but I'm actually for this case here, I'm just going to hit OK and get back to those in a second. That is all I need to do to do a facing operation. Go in, you first you set up your setup, of course. Then you go and select your facing operation. First tab is always where you select your tool. And the second tab is always where you select your geometry. Now, if I go up here and select Simulate, and this is really one of the tools you really need to use. This gives me a uh, visualization on what is actually going to happen out at the machine, right? So I can hit that play button and I can play through and I can see the color coming down, machining off here. I can also go over and turn on stock, which can be kind of nice. Hit play again, you can actually see that it's removing uh, the stock off there. So just be aware that you're using that simulation. I use it all the time. Now, we just created our first toolpath here. We could actually go ahead and post this out if we want to. Um, so when I used to uh, work in industry, many times I would like just rough a couple of operations, get some toolpath on there, and then I would actually post it out to the machine and then go back into the computer and start doing all my finishing operations. Um, we have, this is all, of course, all the post that comes with, um, with uh, Fusion 360, 
there is also a, a website with more posts so if you are into this whole posting trying to figure all this out uh, definitely shoot me an email again and I'll direct you to that um, the Fanuc for example could be another post in here and uh, if I post this code out here just so we can take a look at it because this is really all that matters is the code right all, Fusion is just a tool to actually make the code so we can get the CNC machine to run so in here we will see uh, we, this is very short because we only have that one facing toolpath you will see it's going to do a tool change in here it's going to give us some, some uh, spindle speed it's going to give us a work offset turn the cool down and so forth in here all right, let's put some more toolpath to this part here. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I am going to uh, rough around uh, the outside of the part here. So I'm going to go in and use 2D Adaptive. Now, if you have used other CAM software out there um, and you're an experienced machinist, you're new to Fusion 360, uh, from one machinist to another, you got to check out Adaptive Machining. Uh, and if you're brand new, just just use it. <laughs> That's the best advice. What Adaptive does is it calculates the constant chip load on your cutter. Uh, so it actually calculates between the stock you have defined and the, the part you have in there. So uh, you will have a constant load on your cutter. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go faster, and it's actually also going to um, save uh, tool life, what is great. So again, just like in the facing operation, the first tab is always where you select your tool. So I'm going to go ahead and hit select tool. And in this case here, I'm going to select a flat end mill. Now you will see that I've actually, same thing with the face mill and with the flat end mill, that I do have my, my uh, uh, tool holders in here too, because I really want to get a good representation and what's going to happen out of the machine. You can always go up here on the pencil and it will take you into to the edit mode uh, of your tool. So in here you can specify uh, the tool length in here, what type of cutter you're using. You have your holders. So there's all kinds of holders that comes with, uh, with Fusion. You can even go in and create your own. You can store your feeds and speeds in here. So that's extremely uh, valuable, right? Uh, there's also a post processor tab in here where you can actually do different things like uh, if you want to, if you don't have a tool changer, you maybe want uh, to put a uh, M00 out uh, between each tool chain so you can check that little box and they will make sure it always does that. If you have like a spindle probe like you saw I have on the left side of the table, you can actually check this little box and it will go and check, the t if you have a, a, not a spindle probe, but a table probe, it would actually, after each tool, go over and check to see if, if, the, um, if the tool is there or not, if it's broken. So be aware, of, that was the little pencil. Be aware of you can modify your tool so you have exactly what you see in here. Now the next tab in here is, uh, again, how much a tab, so where we're selecting what we're going to machine, right? Uh, so, so in this case, I'm going to go and select the bottom edge of this part here, click on that, and as soon as I select that, you will see that the software is smart enough, it actually shows the shadow in blue of our stock. So already now, like I said before, the, the 2D Adaptive is actually calculating between the stock and the selected contour, and I just select the bottom edge uh, of that little part there. The third tab is our height tab. Now, I said earlier, I always recommend that you start from the top and work your way down. But people have sent me questions on YouTube and, and other places. They always felt they were a little bit confused about this height tab. So let me, exp let me try to explain it to you how I go about it. I actually go from the bottom up on this one. So I say, anytime you're working inside a CAD software, I always start from the top working your way down. I'm shooting a hole through that rule right now for the Heights tab in Fusion 360. I tell you why. Because when you're in the Heights tab and you're machining, 
<laughs> your most important thing in here is how deep is my cutter going to go, right? That should be like your first animal's instinct when you're a programmer. How deep is this thing going to go? So start from the bottom because that's where you control that. In this case here, it's default to selected contour. How deep I select are uh, because see when I'm doing these pockets in a couple of seconds, like this selected contour from my bottom depth. That's to go. Okay, all right. This go. If you did next one, stock top, but it's kind of like the the deep uh, most conservative one, or, or it could also be model top in here. Um, but stock top is the default, and that's normally good. Now, the next one is the retract height. So, when we're moving between two pockets, how high is the tool going to move above the part? And if you look here in the retract height, that is the stock top plus. 0.2 uh, or 200 thousandths of an inch, right? Uh, so maybe if you're doing metric, this will be five millimeters or something like that. So that is kind of like the the top height plus 200 thousandths. That's the retract height. Now if we go up again, you will see the clearance height, and this is kind of like from a tool change, and it's wrapping around up high. The clearance height is the retract height, so the retract height was the stock top plus 200 thousands plus an additional 400 thousands. So this is why I work from the bottom up because it's kind of like Legos. It's kind of like the bottom height, the top height, and then the retract and the clearance are built upon this. Okay. The next tab is your passes tab. And this has everything to do with the cutter engaged in the material. So think about the end mill being inside of the steel right now. So what we can do in here is we can add multiple depths if we want to. Now be aware of that the 2D adaptive likes to cut with the whole flute length of the cutter. Here we can also control stock to leave. So this is a roughing operation. So I want to leave a little bit of extra material in here. And the last tab is called linking. What this is, is what is the cutter going to do when it's not engaged in material. So this is what I call lead in and lead out and how it rabbits around the part. So let me just recap the five tabs. The first tab is always your tool. Second tab is always where you select your geometry. Third tab is where you select your your depth of cut, so always start from the bottom and kind of like work your way up. This one is the most important one, right? How deep are you going to cut? The fourth tab is our passes tab. This is the cutter actually engaged in the material. And the, the last tab is our linking, so lead in, lead out. Normally uh, less important, right? Uh, um, when it comes to that. Of course it can be, but Let's just take a look at this. So I'm going to hit OK for this. And when I do that, we will see that we now get a tool path showing up here where it's going to machine around this part. Now I'm going to go up and select on my setup so I get both operation. And I'm going to go over here and select simulate so I can see what's going on. So I'm going to hit play. So first is our facing operation. And then here you will see. Uh, our end mill coming in and machining around this part with this 2D uh, adaptive. Okay, looks pretty good. Now I wanted to show you why I selected uh, these two solid jaws as fixtures in our setup. Because if we go back into our 2D adaptive, we can always go back in and edit our operations by right clicking on them and hit edit. And we go back to uh, our heights tab. You might be tempted 
uh, when you're in here and to say, well, I just wanted to go to stock bottom. Well, stock bottom is all the way down there where I specified my stock before, 335,000 down below. So what happens when I hit OK to this? Well, you can kind of see it already that my toolpath are in the jaws, right? But where it really shows up is when I go into simulate this. As soon as I go into the simulation, I haven't even hit, I haven't even hit play yet. Notice how I get, whoops, down the bottom, I get some red lines in my uh, timeline down here that is showing these different crashes. And actually, if I hold over one of them, it actually shows me the tool collides with a fixture. You will also see when I hit play, facing operation is fine, but look what happens with my tool holder. Everything shines red because it's, well, right now, this is ugly, right? If you've ever done this, right now we're machining in our solid jaws. But that's what that fixture checkbox I did on the setup is helping me doing here. It's telling me right to my face that, dude, you're way, way too deep. You are machining right into to these jaws. So this, this don't work. So let me get out of this again. This is, this is bad. But this is what you want to know before you're standing out of the machine, right? Because then it's many times too late. So let's go back into the 2D adapter. I'm going to right click and hit edit and go over to the stock bottom. Now again, if I select, select the contours, it's going to be right at the edge there, right? But I actually have to flip this part over and machine other things. So maybe I want to go a little bit deeper than that, like maybe 50 thousandths below that. And I can do that right down underneath it. There's like an offset. So if I type in minus 50 thousandths, it's going to go 50 thousandths below that selected contour. Now the question is, though, um, is my part high enough over the jaws to go an additional 50 thousandths? Well, you know what? That's the nice thing about being inside of Fusion. We can verify that, right? So we can hit the play button. And yes, we don't get any red. 50 thousands below selected contours is going to be fine on this one. So this is why it's nice to have uh, devices uh, in here. All right, let's move on here um, because I'm getting a little long-winded. Um, so let's just program a couple of other things. I'm going to go in and select these inside pockets in here. So I'm going to pro program those also uh, with the 2D adaptive. Um, So it's like 2D adaptive. And it's like the contours. And then I'm going to, so that's the first tab, right? Always your tool. Second tab is always your geometry. I'm going to go in here and again, I'm always selecting the bottom edge of my pockets because I'm counting on that um, selected contours for my heights tab. Now also I want to specify, you see here when I select those, uh, because it's kind of like a pocketing operation, I get blue inside my pocket. Be aware that there's a little red handle here, and if you click on that, I can actually flip the side I want the cutter on. So if you ever select something and you see that the blue is on the wrong side, just select that little arrow and you get the right size. So I selected the inside of these three pockets. I'm going to go to the Hikes tab. Again, go from the bottom down, bottom up. So again, I have to select the contours, but it's fine. I got the top height, but it's the stock top. That is okay. My retract height is the stock top, like my top height, plus an additional 200 thousands. And the clearance height, which is when it's rubbing or rabbiting around parts, uh, is um, at 400 thousands over the retract height. So stock top plus an additional 600,000. Uh, so look at it like retract height is when it's ravaging between features on a part, and, re and clearance height is when it's ravaging from tool changes, even if you had multiple fixtures on here, uh, and so forth. Going to the uh, passes tab, but has everything to do with the cutter engaged in the material. Again, this is a roughing operation. Uh, I am leaving 15,000 on the side. You might not want to leave anything on the bottom. You can just make that zero if you want to. 
Uh, and the LinkedIn tab here, I'm not going to worry about that right now. I'm just going to hit OK and see what I get on the screen. Now, if you did see that you had a lead in, lead out that would collide with something else, of course, you can always go back in and change that. But this is really the steps uh, to go in and do this, these steps. So again, we can hit on our setup up here, and we can hit uh, the simulate, and now we can simulate through, I'm going to speed it up a little, uh, our different operations. So there was our uh, outside roughing, and then we get our inside roughing here where it's leaving uh, 15,000 uh, on the side. Now, I was going to go in and completely finish this part, but I'm, I'm yapping too slow here, so I'm going to... I'm going to go ahead. I will say that to finish the inside of these pockets, I would use what is called the 2D, 2D contour, what literally just creates a tool path that goes, well, let me just show you. The 2D contour just selects a, a contour tool path that just follows the edge. So if I go in, I'm going to use the same cutter as I did for roughing, what you may choose not to do. I'm going to go in and select the exact same geometry uh, as I did before. Um, the Heights tab, I'm going to leave, that's the same. The Passes tab, uh, you will see in here you can uh, select multiple finishes, you can do multiple depth. I don't have stock to leave on, right, because this is a finishing operation. And um, I'm going to leave the linking, uh, the lead-in, lead-out out of the way here. And we will see we get the finishes passes here with the lead-in, lead-out. So that is literally just uh, one uh, tiny little pass where it's just going to go around the outside and finish, uh, finish the diameter here. Let me just spot these holes because I think that this is important too uh, when it comes to the drilling operation. Then the drilling is somewhat the same. So I'm going to go in and select drilling. And again, the first is always your tool. So uh, I'm going to go in here and hit selecting the tool. Now, I want to show you that you actually have filters up here where you can narrow things down. So if I click on this, you will see whatever is highlighted, that is what the software is going to filter down for. So you can either turn things off by double selecting it, or you can add things. So for example, I want to spot this, so I want the spot drill. So if I just click on that, so that was that little button up here, you will see that spot drills uh, appears. So if I, for example, go into the sample tools and I go down to my tutorial inch, I know that I have a half-inch spot drill sitting in there that I can pick. So I'm going to hit OK. I'm going to go over and select my geometry. Uh, so let me just go in here. All right, I'm sorry, Tracy, I get a comment that my audio is breaking up and down. Uh, it might be a bad connection. Don't forget, it's being recorded. Uh, so the recording should be good out on YouTube if this is too too bad to listen to. I can't do anything about that right now. Um, so let me go ahead and select the drilled holes here. So I'm going to select the inside of the hole that I want to drill. But then be aware that right underneath here, there's actually select same diameter. So I'm going to check that. And as soon as I check that, you will see that it selects all the same uh, size holes. So this is really useful. Now, when it comes to the height tab for this one, again, start from the bottom, work your way up. In here, it says to hold bottom, what may always be great if you're drilling, but this, since this is a spotting operation, I would actually select the uh, model top, because we've already faced it off, or stocked, uh, uh, we already faced it off, so I would select the model top, and then I will just add in 50 thousands, that's what I normally spot with. Okay? So be aware of that height tab there. Uh, that was one of the things I got from a previous webinar there was some confusion about, so I definitely wanted to, to show that. Let me just go ahead here and uh, simulate this so we can see it at this part. I'm going to speed it up. You speed it up and down on this uh, little cursor down here. Speed it up. So there is our outside, there's our uh, pockets. And you can actually go in here, and then we're going to see our finishing, and then our spot drill comes in there. Okay. 
So that is really the steps. And now if we go out and we post this out, you will see that now the code uh, have become a lot longer because now we have uh, all these different um, tool paths in here. All right. I am just going to jump out of this quick um, because uh, we had 45 minutes and I want to show you uh, the second side for this. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to open up uh, another part, the same part, but just in its own window. Because I wanted to show you without having everything uh, set up in here, uh, how we're going to do that. So here's the same part. We machined the first thing. We're just pretending that I actually drilled the holes also. And I, I, I would also have chamfer the outside uh, in here. So we're going to flip the part over. And you know, to flip the part over, I might choose not to put it in a vise, right? I might just do it in a part file like this. That's perfectly fine. That's all right. Um, because I really just got to face it off and, and machine this finished pocket here. So let me go over to my model over here and go into CAM. And I am going to do a setup because that's what we always do. So we're going to go up and select the setup. And again, you will see that my gnomon is all out of whack because that's my luck. Now you will see over here, I don't have to worry about the bodies this time because I don't have 21 components. I only have this one part. So I can start right from the top. This is milling. And then we go into the work coordinate system. And my rule is the first one. So like z-axis and plane and first one. That's the one you should select. And then it's important to remember whatever face we're selecting, that axis is going to go perpendicular to it. So I want the Z axis to point up. So I'm going to select on one of these faces, and the Z axis, the blue one, will, will point towards that perpendicular to that. So I'm going to select this, 3, 2, 1, and there you go. Right now the X axis is pointing up. Now, just like before, I got to rotate this part. Now, before I selected the side of my vise because that was the only face I had the perpendicular because sadly in this part, there's no other perpendicular face. Well, then we're going to go to an edge. And if we're selecting an edge, then it's going to go along it. So a face is perpendicular. And edge is along it. So let me select this X, uh, this edge, because I want the X axis to go along this. Remember, this is being recorded. You can always rewind on YouTube. And I select that, and you will see that now my X axis is going along it, but <laughs> it's going the wrong way. I wanted the Y to point this way. All I have to do is go down and hit flip. And now you will see that it flipped it over. Okay? So just remember this. You always select the first one that comes down to select Z and X plane. Faces, it will go perpendicular. Edges, it will go along. And if you need to flip any of them, you just literally hit that little checkbox and it will flip all day long. Okay. Next thing is going to select my, my points. So I'm going to select the same upper left corner there. So there is my, my uh, work uh, coordinate system. Now, I'm not going to select any fixtures because I don't have anything here. What I want to show you, though, when we get over to the stock, before I use the relative size stock, right? And I could also, again, use this here. would be kind of fine. But, of course, some of you guys are going to say, well, yeah, but that because you hold on to it in the vise, there's some extra material right there right now. And you're absolutely right. What I want to show you is you can actually use from solid. And I use this a lot. Um, you can, well, let me just jump back to our part before. When you simulate your part, so if I go back into the part before, when I simulate everything and everything is done simulating, I want you to know that you can right click out in space and down here, if you right click, there is stock, and you can save the stock out as an STL file. So then we will get what we have just machined. What can be great for the second operation, right? So just after you, you got to be in the simulation, you right click in space, you can save the stock as an STL. But honestly, what I most of the times do is I actually just 
make a copy of this solid and I model another part that looks like my finished part. So I actually have that here. If I go in uh, to my operation, I actually have a stock body that looks, I made it blue, so that would actually look like how our stock will look like after the finished operation. Now I went out of the setup, so now I'm going to go back and do it again. Uh -huh, right? Repetition is the key of learning, as the circle says. So let me just do this again. So I'm going to go in and select my model orientation, the z-axis. Faces go perpendicular. That's great. Then I'm going to select my x-axis because I've got to move it over 90 degrees, but I don't have a face to select. So I'm going to select an edge for that. It points the wrong way. I'm going to flip it, and then I can select my G54 point uh, up here. Now when I go over to the stock over here, I'm going to turn on that uh, solid body. I can select that as from solid. What that means is that now my stock, when I verify, is going to be this that I just modeled on. This is definitely something we can talk more about if you want to. I can go ahead and hide it here. But you can see now in my view here that my origin is now sitting up on that top of that stock. The only other thing I want to do in here is I want to go to the post-processing tab and maybe change this to a number two if I want this to be G55 in my code. Okay. I'm going to hit OK here, and we will now see we have that little gnomon sitting uh, over here. And now I can do exactly what we did before. I can go in here. I can select the facing operation. It's always, the first tab is always our tool. So I'm going to go in here and select my face end mill. Go and hit OK. Now my uh, geometry, it already knows it's going to machine around that, that body, so that should be fine. I can click OK. And when I go in and simulate this, we will see that now we get that stock model that I created as a solid and it machined that off. Now there might be a little, I'll play that again, might be a lot of stock there for this poor face mill to take off. Don't worry about that, just like anything else. If we go back in and edit it, on the Passes tab, I can say multiple depth, and I maybe only want this face mill to go down 100 thousandths per, per step, and now you will see uh, that I get those uh, steps in there, and now you will see that uh, that it will do uh, those there. All right. I went a little bit longer uh, than I, uh, I I wanted to here, so I'm gonna f I wanted to finish up the part. But really, the next step to put in the adaptive and the, the clearance and all that stuff that's the same thing. So let's answer some questions here uh, because I bet you guys uh, there's gotta be something that was confusing for you guys. Um, I can't believe that I did such a good job. That uh, that you would they would have gotten that. So let me just look here. Let's start up on the top. Um, I hope I didn't talk all my European friends to sleep. Um, we talked a little bit about tooling right before I started the webinar. Uh, so definitely, you know, what I actually recommend when you're buying tooling is that you uh, go out and uh, and call the tool vendor and make sure that they will provide you feeds and speeds and support. So don't, don't just go for the cheapest cutter. I mean, uh, I think it's really valuable that you go out and you find some, some tooling uh, vendor that you can trust. So uh, the way you find the, the good places is by actually talking to them. Somebody in the chat uh, recommended for the US at least is Lakeshore Carbide. Uh, I have talked to those guys too. They're great guys. Definitely somebody to, uh, uh, to, to be aware of. Um, Somebody is asking me about would I recommend Fusion for Fab Labs or Fabrication Labs. Absolutely. We are already uh, out there uh, on a lot of them. Don't worry. Uh, send me an email if you want me to get you in contact with somebody who can help you with that. Uh, are Vice models available for download in Fusion? Yes. Um, you can actually, you can either email me and I'll be more than happy to share what you got. But we actually started doing this uh, just recently. 
if you go into your sample library that everybody have, if you scroll down to the bottom, there's a CAM sample library in here. If you go in here, we have added all kinds of different things, including work holding. So here's actually the device that I'm just using right now, uh, and we're going to add more stuff in here. So definitely make sure you, you check that out. Um, okay. Uh, what does the software choose as cutter based on the size of feature to the machine? No. Clem, it does not do that. The software uh, is not trying to figure out what will be the right size cutter for the pocket. And I'll tell you why it don't. And I'm talking just out of experience here because uh, I used to use a software that tried to do that. It never ever gets it right, right? I mean, like, uh, you, you know, um, software can do a lot of things, but uh, it's just not that clever. Uh, or there will be too many variables um, that you need to go in and select what size cutter you want to use uh, for for your different uh, operations in that. Um, all right, so um, my machine is custom built. How do I find a post processor? Well, it really depends on kind of like what. Uh, what your controller takes. So when you bought your controller for your for your custom build machine, uh, it probably had some kind of information on what it what it, it needs. So hopefully it just needs generic G code, and then you could go get away with a knock post or a has post. Again, email. Well, actually, you know the best thing probably to do if you want to get a resource is to either uh, go out to Google. And search Autodesk and Post Processor, and you get taken right to our Post Processor page, cam.autodesk.com forward slash posts. Here are all the different posts we support. So there's more here than there is inside the software you can get a hold of. The other thing is there's a great library, uh, uh, there's a great forum. If you go to Autodesk Forum for post, again, send me an email, and I'll be happy uh, to direct you uh, to that. Um, all right. Uh, sorry about the audio again. This is being recorded. Hopefully, it's a lot better. Um, when I flipped the part over, uh, the model was not symmetrical. Wouldn't the new uh, work corner sensor be incorrect to the machined? A tool path. Well, so um, so this is probably a good point. Um, when we are in our work offset in here, uh, yes, if you're using stock uh, box point, it will default to whatever I have modeled up in here. But be aware of you also have selected points. So you could actually, if I say select points, I can actually select a specific area like a hole or something like that. Um, and you actually also have model stock points. So there's a lot of different uh, options in here. So it should be good. I have never tried where I couldn't couldn't do it. <laughs> Lucas, I'm glad you're still uh, awake here. Uh, all right. All right. So how do I get my wire set up on my my uh, on my machine? So that's a very good uh, point here. So I give you the device. Well, how do you now get it it all up here? I would the easiest way with one minute left is to go. Again, out to my YouTube channel. So go to YouTube, search Lars Christensen um, and YouTube. And uh, I just did a video about assemble uh, and where I actually did that exact thing. I actually put a vice on a table um, and, and all that stuff. It's called assembly uh, and joints. So search for that video and you should hopefully be all good. If not, then you, you just go ahead and email me. All right, guys. Uh, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna stop here. Uh, I hope it didn't get um, I hope it didn't get too far in, uh, and I didn't get too fast. Like again, uh, this title is Fusion 360 Cam Basics. So my if I did my job good, then you would feel good about um, you know going in and playing around with Cam within Fusion 360. And if, if, if I didn't succeed, do me a favor, send me some feedback, lars.christensen.com, 
you know, uh, I definitely, I always love, love your feedback. And uh, again, this recording will go up on the Fusion 360 uh, YouTube channel within the next couple of days. Um, and, um, and you can find it there. And also, if you want to get more uh, stuff where you want to, um, then, you know, my YouTube channel has uh, a lot of stuff there too. There's definitely a lot of material out there. So, everybody, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day. For my European friends, good night, <laughs> sleep well. Uh, I hope definitely this was well worth your time. So until the next time, guys, thank you so much, and uh, have an awesome day.